All right, you guys may be seated. As you take your seats, if you guys wouldn't mind opening your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. So we're going to be studying this morning in um, Ephesians chapter 4. For those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Nathaniel. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at the church. I oversee the worship ministry, um, and I get the privilege of of sharing with you guys this morning. Um, My my papa, my dad, I never call him papa, I don't know why. Dada is gone right now. Um, he is he's in he's currently in Denver. He was in New Mexico. There's a mission school uh, out in New Mexico that trains up young missionaries. It sends them out on the field. Um, they spend time in Uganda and uh, other various countries. It's an amazing place. But my dad got the opportunity to go and speak at that school and, and do some teaching there. And now he's in Denver uh, with his oldest daughter Carolyn and her husband John Geraci at Cal- Calvary South Denver, um, which is the church that my dad helped plant years and years ago. Um, so I think he's, it's awesome that he's getting to go, that he's getting to go uh, be a part of those things and see the fruit of the church that he started a long time ago. Um, but now you're stuck with me, so uh, sorry about it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, if you guys are there, we're going to go ahead and read. It says this, it says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And we are going to stop there. I know one verse, I was talking to Greg earlier, he said, that's a lot, you're going to do the whole sermon on one verse? He's like, that's a lot of hang time. I was like, yep, I know, no. But we're going to just go over this one verse. Uh, Really, what I want to talk about this morning is, uh, I want to talk about calling. God's calling on your life. I think calling is, is something that, you know, as, as a younger believer, you, I think you think about and approach calling maybe differently than you do as an older believer, somebody who's walked with the Lord for a long time, somebody who's walked through seasons of life, maybe who's walked in what they believe God has called them to. But I think either way, calling is something that brings up a, a, a lot of big questions. I think for younger believers, it's questions like, does, does God have a plan for my life? You know, what am I supposed to do? What, what job am I supposed to have? What, who am I supposed to marry? What am I supposed to do with my life? That's a big and intimidating question, especially for young believers. God, what do you want me to do? And I think for maybe people who've been with the Lord, who maybe started walking in a, in a calling or not, uh, you know, it brings up questions of, Lord, what is the purpose of the season I'm in? Or maybe you've just ended something. Maybe you, you've retired or you, you've, you've stepped out of a work and you're like, God, where do I go now? What is the point of this season? Is there a purpose in this season? And so again, it, it, it brings up a lot of big questions, you know, and I think it can be a place of maybe anxiety, sometimes frustration, maybe frustration towards God, like, God, what do you want me to do, you know? Um, and, and, and wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be so awesome if the Lord just like, was just like, this is exactly what your life is going to look like. If he just gave you a blueprint, he's like, boom, day one, you're born, this is, this is where you're going to be born, this is what your life is going to look like, this is what your childhood is going to look like, you know, you're, you're, you're a great kid, you're going to be really annoying, but your parents love you, so that's okay. In middle school, you're going to go to this school, you're going to have these many friends, you might move while you're in middle school, but this is what it's going to look like. From the ages 10 to 15, you're basically just going to be awkward all the time, but that's okay, because at 16, you have a glow up, things get better, right? You go to college, this is the degree I want you to have. This is, this is what I want you to study. This is who you're going to marry. This is, this is where you're going to work. This is how many kids I want you to have. This is your financial plan for when you get married and so when you retire. Here's the church I want you to be a part of. Here's the ministry I want you to do. Here's the work. Here's the big step of faith I want you to take, but don't worry, I, I'm in it, and you'll see how it's going to work out, right? Here's all the seasons of suffering you're going to face. Here's all the hardship. Here's all the loss. Here's all the pain. Here's all the good things. You know, wouldn't that be wonderful if the Lord had just said, here you go. Man, that would be so great. You know, and, and even if it was hard things we had to walk through, it would be so great to see the ending and know, right? And so even though, even though God doesn't do that for us, the good news is God has a lot to say about your calling. God has a lot to say about your calling. And so the big question, right, does, does God have a call on my life? And is there a purpose for the season that I'm in right now? And the answer is yes. He absolutely has a call in your life. And yes, there's absolutely a purpose for the season that you are in right now. Ephesians 2.10, it says that, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, so the question of God, do you have work for me to do? Do you have a direction for my life? Absolutely he does. Before, again, before you even existed, God had had plans. He's like, man, I'm going to create this person and this is what I want them to do. This is the work that I have for them to do. So does God have a plan for your life? Yes, he does. And, and again, in Psalm 139, this is a very familiar verse. It says that my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, and your eyes saw my unformed sur- substance, my unformed surface, that too, substance in, in your book was written every one of them, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, yet when as yet there was none of them. So again, and the question is, is there a purpose for this season? Well, did God create every single day for you to walk in? Is there a day that's on accident? Did God slip a day in and be like, whoops, I don't know. He can, he can just take a nap that day. That one doesn't count, you know? But that's not what happened, right? There's a purpose for every day, every season, right? So there should be no doubt in everyone's mind there is a divine calling and a heavenly purpose on your life. It kind of reminds me of... Um, of uh, Loki from the Avengers. Do you guys remember when he first he first showed up on the scene and he comes out of this per- this portal and everyone's like freaking out like who is this person and the, what is the first thing he says? He says he says I am Loki of Asgard and I am burdened with glorious purpose. And I was like that makes me think of like that's a fitting saying for Christians. You know, I am I am Nathaniel Berea and I am burdened with glorious purpose. It's a weird thing to say, but the truth is there. And now, obviously, our goal is not to enslave the humankind and, you know, everything that Loki did. We've got better goals in mind. But the, the truth is, is there in either way, that you have, you are burdened with glorious purpose, that the Lord has a plan for you. You have divine and heavenly purposes on your life. But what I want to address this morning is, is how we think about our calling, how we think about our calling. We tend to think about our calling as, as a task. God, what do you want me to do? What, what is the job you want me to do? What is the work you want me to do? What is, what, is the, what is the do? What is God calling me to do? That's how we think about calling. What am I supposed to do? Now, don't get me wrong. God does call us to tasks. He calls us to works. He calls us to ministries. He calls us to jobs. But what we need to understand is that God's call on your life is, is so much bigger than a task. And it's so much bigger than a job. It's so much bigger than just something for you to do. God's call on your life is bigger than something for you to do. Understand, before God calls you to do something, God is calling you to be someone. Before God ever calls you to do, he is calling you to who. So the question we should be asking ourselves is, before we ask God, what are you calling me to do? We need to ask ourselves, God, who are you calling me to? to be. Who before do? Pastor Craig Rochelle says this in in his message. He says that calling is about who you are before what you do. And I thought that was such a great principle and a great uh, framework to work from as as we think about our calling. It's who we are before what we do. And understand because who you are is an an all-encompassing call. What you do is just one task, one item, one avenue, right? But who you are affects everything that you are doing. So it's not just the one task that's affected, but it's every task, not just the significant pieces of your life, but the little pieces of your life, not just the big, important relationships, but maybe the casual relationships and the smaller ones, right? It affects everything you do. Who you are is an all-encompassing call. So our calling is first a who before it is a do. So, God, who are you calling me to be? And the good news, guys, is that the Bible has so much to say. So much to say about who we are called to be. And so, I think I have a few verses that I want to set up for us that kind of give us a picture of what God is calling us to to do, or I'm sorry, of who God is calling us to be. Now, understand, there is a like I said, there's a lot that the Bible has to say about who God is calling you to be. And so this isn't going to be an exhaustive look at, at who God is calling you to be. But I want to just kind of set up for us this picture of the calling that God calls, has on, on who you're supposed to be. So the first verse is this. It's First Peter chapter 1. It says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all of your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So the the first thing I want to get in your mind is is it's a calling to holiness. It's this idea of, of being set apart, 
for God's purposes and being sanctified from sin, right? This is the picture of holiness. This is the first idea I want to get in your head. The second one is in Romans chapter 12. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we have this picture of of holiness, of being set apart for the Lord. We have this picture of our life not belonging to us, but instead it's being placed on the altar and saying, God, my life belongs to you. Uh, I, I am a holy sacrifice. I'm being set apart and being set upon the altar for you. And I think, again, I think another good verse that just kind of really gives us this big picture and, and maybe combines the two of those things is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says that I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the picture is you are called to be holy, a living sacrifice set apart by God, so overtaken by Christ that you would say, God, it is no longer, it's not even my life anymore. It is you who are now living through me, right? And so your who is to be set apart, to be placed on the altar and completely overtaken by Christ so that Christ is in everything you do. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So it's Christ who, who's, who lives in me, who's accomplishing the task, who's affecting the relationship, who's affecting the job, who's affecting the, the, the minute pieces of my life. It's Christ in me. So why is this so important? Why is it so important that we approach our calling this way, that before I can address what I do, and, and, and my first calling is to be who? Why is that so important? Well, number one, it's because who has priority over do. Understand, when Jesus came and he, when he went and he saw the religious leaders in his day, understand, they were busy. They were active, right? They were serving in the temple. They were uh, tithing and, 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 and fulfilling all of their priestly duties, right? And so there was a lot of work being done, right? They were very busy, but understand, what was the, what was the Lord's criticism of them? He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all unclean, uncleanness. So you outwardly appear righteous to others, right? You are doing a lot of work. You are busy. On the outside, you're doing a lot of stuff. You outwardly, you appear like you're doing great, but within, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And understand, you guys, God, God is not looking for us just to have busy work. God isn't just up in heaven like, what's something else I can put on their plate? They're not, they're not doing enough. I need them just to be busier. That's not what God is concerned about. God has work for us to do, yes, but what God is concerned about first and foremost is, is who he has called you to be. That, that your heart is close to the Lord. And this was his criticism of the Pharisees. Like, you're very active, sure. You're doing a lot, Sure. But, but, but your heart is far from me, and that's a problem. And, and it's hypocritical of you to, to say, I can do the work of the Lord without being close to the Lord. And so the, the, the call that he puts on the Pharisees is, no, listen, you address who before you address do. Who you are in Christ, who you are before me, matters before what you do. Remember, at, at the end of the time, when, when, when we stand before the Lord, we give an account for our life. What does Jesus say is going to happen? He says, on that day, meaning the day of the Lord, many will say to me, Lord, did did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works in your name? God, were we not just, were we not busy? Were we not doing so much for you? But what does he say to them? He says, well, I'll, I'll I'll declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Who you, you, you never walked in holiness before me. You never addressed who I called you to be. You were busy, sure, but, but who you were called to be was never a priority to you. But it is to me. I Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Understand, you guys, we can't fool the Lord. We can't fool the Lord. He sees right through what we're doing to our hearts, right? 
And he sees in what manner the, our work is to be done before him. And not only that, but the work that we do is going to be tested, right? This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. He says, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. And the day is the day of the Lord when we stand before the Lord and give an account. And he says, your work will become manifest for that day. God will expose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself can be saved, but only as through fire. Understand, we cannot fool the Lord. And your, your work is going to be tested. It's going to be placed on the altar. You can't stand on that. That's going to be exposed. We can't concern, we can't fool the Lord. He is concerned first and foremost about who he's calling you to be. That is the first calling that's on your life. And, and because the issue is if, if who you are isn't right before the Lord, then what you do is not going to be either. If who you are is not right before the Lord, what we do is not going to be right either. We were just at a pastor's conference this last weekend in, um, in Stone Mountain, Georgia. And Sandy Adams was uh, talking, and he said that before the ministry counts here on earth, it has to count in heaven. Before what we do here can be correct, what we do with the Lord has to be correct, who we are before the Lord has to be correct. And he was talking about the story of Job, and he was saying that, you know, what's amazing about the story of Job is, is not just that, that Job was confident in God, that God would restore everything to him, but that, but that God's confidence was in Job. That as, as the enemy stood before the Lord and accused Job, that God was confident in who his servant was. And, and you know, and so then the question we have to ask ourselves, like, man, if, if, if I was in that position, do, you, do you, I feel like that you would be confident in who I am before you? If the enemy was to stand before you and accuse me, Lord, and say if the work that they're trying to do is completely unfruitful, he's going to walk away from you. Right? Is there confidence in the Lord that who we are before him is who it needs to be? So Jesus' um, exhortation to the Pharisees, he says, you blind Pharisee, clean the inside of the cup. And then the plate, I'm sorry, yeah, clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside may be also clean. So it is the Lord's priority. Who is priority before do, right? The Lord can, is concerned about who you are before what you do. And understand, you guys, the Lord knows us. The Lord knows that, that really that we need him. You know, what does the Bible say in John fifteen five? It says that he's the vine and we are the branches. If we abide in the Lord, we'll bear much fruit. But apart from God, what? You can say it. Apart from God, we can do what? Nothing. And the Lord knows that. He knows that. So who we are is so important. It has to be addressed before what we do. So why is who before do so important? Number one, because who has priority over do in the Lord's eyes. And number two, because being faithful to who God has called you to be means there's never a wasted do. I think it's easy for us to fall into a, a mindset that thinks that because we aren't doing anything significant at the moment, that our, that our time is just wasted right now. That, that because we're not in the middle of, of something great, that, that our time is just kind of pointless, right? That, God, I'm, I'm just working at a fast food place until the job I really want becomes a reality. Or, or God, I'm just working at, I'm working at the mall until, until I get things sorted out and I can actually figure out what I want to do with my life. Or I'm in the middle of school so I can figure out, uh, so I can get a degree so then I can do something meaningful, right? Or I'm just a stay-at-home mom and all I do is maintain chaos and, and change diapers, you know, and, and, and it doesn't feel significant. And, and the temptation is to feel like this time is just wasted, right? And we all know our own struggle, right? I'm just blank. Or, or I'm not doing blank. Therefore, therefore, my time is just wasted. What's the point of this season? What is the point here? I want you to look at the story of Joseph. In Genesis chapter 37, um, Joseph was the son of Jacob, and he had the 12 brothers, and Joseph was the favorite child. Does anybody have any favorite siblings? Uh, that's a trick question. Parents, you shouldn't answer that. No, <laughs> right? But I, man, siblings, you all know when you have siblings, that's always that's the constant battle, right? Who's the favorite? Who's the, we have a running list in our family, and whether it has any real grounds or not, I don't know. But we always like to pick each other, uh, pick on each other about it. Laura thinks I'm the favorite, and so um, she resents me for it. Anyways, um, <laughs> that's not important. I love you, Laura. Um, 
I'm just King Julian say, it's nothing personal. I'm just better than you. <laughs> just kidding. I don't think that at all. Um, anyways, Joseph. Joseph was a favorite child, and, and, you know, he was given a coat of many colors. He was given a dream by the Lord that his brothers were going to bow down to him, and he told his brothers about it, and oh, man, you know, could you imagine? Could you imagine if I told Laura, Laura had this dream last night, and God said that I'm going to rule over you, and one day you're going to bow to, oh, man, she, she would kill me. And so, um, in like manner, Joseph's brothers were like, I'm going to kill you. This is crazy. So they were upset. And, and then Joseph's oldest brother, Reuben, had some sense and was like, we can't, you guys, we can't kill our brother. And so how about we throw him into a hole? So instead they throw him into a hole because uh, you got to do something, I guess. If murder's not on the table, there's a hole. Um, so they throw him into a hole and Joseph gets sold then into slavery. So Joseph's in slavery. He enters Potiphar's house. And he works there for however many years. And then Joseph gets accused of sexual assault. And he gets thrown into prison. And then Joseph is in prison for however many years. Now we have the benefit of knowing the end of the story, right? We get to see that God used Joseph to interpret the baker and the cupbearer's dream. Which then opened the door for him to interpret Pharaoh's dream. Which then allowed him to become second in command of all of Egypt. Which then allowed him to, to save his family and countless others from the famine. Which also secured a place for the nation of Israel to grow, right? So we have the benefit of seeing all of that. But what we need to understand, guys, is from the time that Joseph was sold into slavery until he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, that time period, he was either a slave or in prison for, for roughly 11 years. We don't know for sure the timeline, but, but most people speculate it's around 11 to 12 years. So could you imagine 11 to 12 years of your life either in slavery or or in prison. And can you imagine Joseph's temptation to think, God, what is the point of the season I'm in? I'm just serving, I'm just serving some guy who doesn't even honor you. Is there a point to what I'm doing right now? Or God, I'm just, I'm sitting in a jail cell rotting away. Can you imagine the temptation that Joseph had to fall into that thinking of, God, this season is a waste. There's no point in this time. So the question is, in those times, did God have a call on Joseph's life? Yes, he did. When Joseph was a slave to Potiphar, did he have a call in his life? Yes, he did. When Joseph was sitting in jail for years, did God have a call in his life? Yes, he did. So instead of of falling into the temptation, into the trap that says, God, this time is useless, and Joseph just slacking off, Joseph was faithful because God had called Joseph to be who he wanted him to be. And so Joseph was faithful to the call of who, even when the do seemed meaningless. He said, God, I'm going to be faithful to who you called me to be, even when what I'm doing seems pointless, right? And so, you know, it it wasn't easy at the moment, but but there was not a single wasted piece of piece of time in Joseph's life where where God wasn't moving or working, right? This is why the Bible says to us, the encouragement in Ephesians 5, it says, look carefully how you walk. Look carefully, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, meaning don't fall into the temptation that thinks that there's no point to what I'm walking through. Don't don't begin to slack off in who God has called you to be because what you're doing seems meaningless. It's like, no, don't be foolish. That is foolish thinking. God has a call on your life right now. But instead of being foolish, be wise. Understand what the the will of the Lord is. And what what God's will for you in this season is for you to be faithful to be who, who he called you to be. And again, it wasn't easy to see at the moment. But there was not a single wasted moment in Joseph's life, right? And we see that as Joseph was faithful to be who God called him to be, the Lord was working, right? In Potiphar's house, God raised up Joseph, and Joseph was, instead of slacking off and feeling like this is wasted time, he honored the Lord, and the Lord built him up, and Joseph became head over um, Potiphar's household, right? And And God blessed Joseph, and Joseph had favor in what he was doing. And then even when that was taken away from him, did he say, well, God, I honored you, and, and now look at now I'm in jail, No, he honored the Lord while he was in prison. And and then the Lord used him while he was there. And Joseph became over all the other prisoners in the guard. What a weird privilege to have, to be in in charge of prisoners. You know, you're a prisoner, but in charge of everyone. But God gave him that. So again, we don't see the whole picture. Joseph didn't see the whole picture, but, but the Lord does. 
The Lord knows that, there, that there's not a wasted moment or season in your life. God is never up to nothing. So the encouragement to you is, is what the Bible says in 2 Timothy. It says, be ready in season and out of season. And some of us feel like we are out of season. And so what is the encouragement to us? Be ready. Be faithful to who God has called you to be. Right? And, and you know, um, in, in 1 Peter, the, the passage that says we're called to be holy for the Lord is holy, right before he says that, the encouragement, what Peter says right before that, he says, listen, you need to gird up the loins of your mind. It's a weird saying. He's saying, prepare for action. Be ready. That's what the encouragement was. And so, so our job is to be ready in season and out of season, to be faithful to who God has called us to be, no matter how meaningless what we're doing seems. Because being faithful to who means never a waste to do. God is never up to nothing. And just like Joseph, we don't see the whole picture, but your job is to be faithful to who God called you to be. So, why is who before do so important? Number one, because who has priority over do. And number two, because being faithful to who means never a waste to do, never a wasted season. And number three, why is who so important? Because holding fast to who God calls you to be is a safeguard from idolizing what God calls you to do. Understand, this, this one is extremely important. And I think this is one that can kind of sneak up on us. Um, because God doesn't call us to do bad things, right? You know, the calling on your life is good things. It's ministry, it's work, it's, it's building the kingdom. God doesn't call you to be a bank robber, right? And, you know, it's like, of course, idolizing that's going to be a problem, right? But if you're, if you're called to do ministry, there, I think it's harder for us to see when, when we begin to cling to the calling tighter than we're clinging to the Lord. And that thing is a hard thing to see at moments because what we're clinging to is seemingly a good thing. This is what the Lord wants me to do. But understand there's, there's a problem when the call or the position or the job is more important to you than who God is calling you to be. There's a problem when, when, you're, when this is more precious to you than, than the Lord. That's a problem. Because what happens, guys, is, is, is who you are begins to take a back seat. And, and what's driving now is, is the success of the task. Maybe the status that you receive, the image that you have, the, the popularity or the income or whatever it may begin. But who you are takes a back seat. And what's driving is, is the success of your task. Guys, how many, many, how many men and women in Christ who have been given tremendous positions by God, pastors, CEOs, Musicians, actors, politicians, who, you know, who knows? How many of them ended up falling because they loved the position that was given to them by God more than they loved the Lord? Because what, what took a front seat was the success of the task or holding on to the task, and what took a back seat was their character before the Lord. And that was their downfall. And, you know, it doesn't just happen to, to, to people in big positions. You know, I think we see that more because they're in the public eye. But it happens to everybody. Anyone who, who puts what they do ahead of who they are in Christ is in danger of, of that, that falling away from the Lord. And it's a problem. Our job, you guys, is to have the, the same heart that Moses had when he told the Lord, he said, God, I, I don't even want to go into the promised land. I don't even want to receive your blessing if you're not going to go with me. I, I don't even want to be in the promised land if you're not going to come with me. In Exodus 33, we see this exchange. It says, God said to Moses, he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, he said, if your presence will not go with me, don't even bring me up from here. Don't even bring us into the promised land. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine all, you know, 40 years in the wilderness and, 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 and coming to this place and God was saying, I'm going to give you your blessing. Well, what kind of temptation would there be if, if the Lord said, I'm going to give you this blessing, but I won't go with you? you know, that, that had to be tempting. Now, that's not what the Lord says to Moses, but understand Moses' heart was correct. He was saying to the Lord, God, more than I want your blessing, I just want you. God, more than, I, more than I want to be in this calling, I just want to be close to you. More than I want this job, Lord, I just want to be close to you. More than I want this position or, or whatever it may be, God, but more than I want what your blessings, I, I just want to be close to you. 
Remember, guys, God doesn't just want busy work from us. He doesn't want you to just be busy. He wants to be close to you. He wants you to honor the Lord in your heart and in your character. And so our approach to God should be the same thing. God, more than I just want to be busy, I just want to be close to you. More than I just, more than I want to accomplish my dreams, or more than I want to accomplish even the, what you have for me, I just want to be close to you. The Lord's approach to us is that, and, and our approach to the Lord should be the same. God, what's our biggest priority is that we love one another, that, we, that our, our relationship is where it needs to be. God's not looking for busy work. He just wants to be close to you. So why is who we are before what we do so important? Number one, because who we are has priority over what we do. If who we are isn't right before the Lord, then what we do won't be either. God has never... Uh, God doesn't want you just to be busy. He just wants to be close to you. Number two, because being faithful to who means never a wasted do. God is is never up to nothing. The season that you are in right now is not a waste. The encouragement is to be ready in season and out of season. And you may be out of season, but it's not a waste. You know, and and Joseph is a great example, but man, there are so many people to look at. You look at the life of King David, who was given a promise that he's going to be king. And and what happened between that promise given and the time he received that promise? David's life was crazy. You know, he was chased all over the place, trying to get murdered by Saul. But but David had to be faithful to who God called him to be. Or you think of of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when there, when the nation of Israel was taken into Babylon and 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 they were enslaved to these people. And and what did they do? They were faithful to to be who God called them to be. So our encouragement is the same. Be ready in season and out of season. No matter how insignificant it may seem, God is never up to nothing. And the third thing, holding fast to who is a safeguard from idolizing the do. We must love the Lord more than we love his blessing. We don't want to just be busy. We want to be close to the Lord. So back to Paul's exhortation in Ephesians 4.1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, I, I urge you, I beg you, I beseech you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, Lord, am I walking in a worthy manner right now? Am, am, I, so, am I clinging so closely to what you want me to do that I'm beginning to, to let who you want me to be compromise? And, and maybe it's not even big compromises. Maybe it's not even huge, you know, sins that, or addictions, but it's just, am I compromising because of what I'm doing? Am I compromising the time I'm spending with you? Am I compromising, am I prioritizing what I'm doing over, over the time I'm spending with you? That's a compromise. And, and that's wrong. That's wrong thinking. And maybe for some of us it is sin. Maybe, maybe we are just blatantly, we are in sin and, and we are neglecting to deal with it. And the Lord is saying, you need to stop what you're doing and address this issue. The Bible says, since we are so surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let's lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race that is set before us. Right, so have, have we stumbled? Have we fallen? The encouragement is, is get up. Don't stay there. Don't wallow in it. Get up. If you need to confess, confess. If you need to refocus your, your eyes on the Lord, refocus your eyes on the Lord. If you need to temporarily or even permanently let go of what you're doing so that who you are before the Lord can be right, then you need to let go. If you need to reprioritize your life, if you need to cut things out of your life so that your time with the Lord can be a priority, then you need to cut things out of your life. The Lord is concerned with who you are. Before what you do. Now, as I stated before, I believe God does call us to specific tasks, to specific jobs, specific ministries and churches and missions and works. Right? This is what he says in Ephesians 2.10. He says, You're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared for you. There are specific things that God wants you to do. He has work for you to do. And so it's important for us as we think about that to to approach it correctly that before I can even address what I'm doing, I have to make sure that who I am is correct before you, Lord. 
So what I did want to do is I, I want to leave us with some practical ways, some practical things we can do. If you're facing the question of, God, I'm trying to figure out specifically what you're calling me to, I, I want to leave us with some practical ways we can figure that out. Now, this isn't going to be a, a, a magical list that's going to be poof, you know, this is exactly God's will for your life. It doesn't work that way. But these are good practical steps, good practical things you can do as you're trying to determine, God, what are you calling me to do? Um, this is a list that I, I heard John Piper give, and I thought it was really good, um, but I, I'm simplifying it, and I'm kind of making it my own, but it, it didn't originate from me. Um, but it says, this is the list, right? There's, there's four things we can do, four steps. If you're trying to figure out, Lord, what are you trying to get me to do? There's four principles we can hold on to. Number one, consider your, your gifting and your skills. So how has God gifted you spiritually? Do you have a, a spiritual gift of teaching or discernment? or hospitality, or encouragement, or words of wisdom, or, or prophecy, or leadership, whatever it may be, consider your, your spiritual gifts. And if you don't know what God has given you, what spiritual gifts you have in your life, go to somebody around you who, who's seen you walk with the Lord, who's seen your life, and ask them. Say, God, or say, not, they're not God. Brother, sister, <laughs> what, what gifts do you see in my life? And, and you know, I think the, the Lord, we can see it. You know, we see each other serving. We see the anointing and the gifting that it has on our life. So go to them, ask them, consider what gifting you have. Um, consider the practical skills God has given you. Are you a carpenter? Are you uh, an electrician? Are you a plumber? Are you good at organizing things? Are you good at cooking? Are you good at um, music? Do you practice medicine? Are you an, an artist? Do you have nunchuck skills or computer hacking skills? Thank you, Laura. <laughs> this is Napoleon Dynamite. I don't know if anyone is. Great movie. Anyways, but consider your spiritual gifts. Consider your practical gifts. Consider your gifting. Number two. Consider the needs around you that move you deeply, right? Is, is there a need or an issue that when you hear it, it weighs heavy on your heart? That, that, that when you hear this thing talked about, that, man, it, it just gets you. That it's, man, this is heavy on my heart. I, I genuinely care about this issue or this need, whatever it may be. Is there a specific, is it a, is a ministry that needs to take place that, that's heavy on your heart? Is, is there a specific need in the world? Is there a specific need from a people or a people group? Is there a specific need in the economy? Is there a specific need in the church? Right, something again that when you hear about it, it's just, it moves you. You're like, man, this is, I, I care about that. I care about that thing. That's the second one. Is there a need that moves you? And number three is, is, is there a reoccurring interest or, or a growing awareness of that need? Does that need keep popping up? in conversation, in, in your social media feed, as you're watching the news, as you're talking to people? What is, that, is there something that keeps reoccurring? Something that you feel like God just keeps bringing up over and over and over again in your life? Understand, and is that, is that if it moves you deeply and it keeps coming up, is it maybe, maybe it's more than just a need. Maybe there's a burden. Maybe they feel like, man, there's just like this weight on my chest when I think about this thing and I just can't get it off. I just feel like the Lord is continually to press this on my heart. That's how it started for my dad when we first moved out here. We, we visited, we had family in Charleston and, and he came and he was just, there was just this weight on his heart about Charleston and he went home and it just stayed there. And, he, and, and, and the Lord kept bringing it up over and over and over again. So is the Lord doing that? Is he bringing up a need or an interest? Is there something that just is put on your heart? So that's number three. Number four is then, is then to do your due diligence of godly decision making. That's something that Tracy Tucker likes to say. Doing your due diligence of godly decision making. That means, number one, praying over the need or the work, right? Just simply asking the Lord point blank, God, are you calling me to do this? And it's not a one and done prayer, right? You don't just pop it up and see what happens, you know, but you, you're faithful to, to come before the Lord and ask him and say, God, are you calling me to do this? If so, would you, would you confirm it? Would you, would you not give me peace uh, about this until this work is done? Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe, Lord, would you take this from me and, 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 and make it clear to me? But spend time praying over it. Number two, spend time seeking the Lord in his word. You know, the Bible says that your, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I think we tend to think maybe big lofty things, but I think that's a very practical uh, verse that you can approach the Lord practically in his word and say, God, is this something you're wanting me to do? And you seek him in his word and he'll speak to you about it. 
Another piece of doing your due diligence of, of godly decision making is seeking counsel from other mature believers. The Bible says that where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there's safety. So your job is, is to be diligent to go to people around you. And, and maybe it's a pastor or a teacher or your parents or friends or family. And you say, okay, hey, this is what I've been praying about. This is what I feel like there's a need that I keep seeing coming up and, and it's heavy on my heart. Do you think God could be calling me to do this? And understand you guys, if we're diligent to do these things, if we're diligent to, to pray and to seek the Lord in his word and to ask people around us about it, God will piece together affirmation or confirmation of, of, of the direction for your life. And again, it's not a magic formula. It's not a poof. But, but understand, there's, there's, there's so much safety if you're approaching decision-making, if you're approaching God's direction in your life this way, it's going to be hard to go wrong. And so, again, our job is to, if we're, if we're trying to figure out, well, Lord, what are you wanting me to do? Number one, consider your gifting and your skills. Number two, consider the needs around you that move you deeply. Number three, is there a growing interest or awareness in a specific need? And number four, do your due diligence of godly decision making. And, and the Lord will be faithful to direct you. God is calling us to walk worthy of our calling. He has work for you to do. He wants you to address who you are before what you do. And when it's time to come to, to figure out what God wants you to do, do your due diligence. Approach it correctly. Let's pray. Father, we come before you.